I'm the research and programming specialist at Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site. Welcome to Searchlight. We have a great program in store for you this evening, but first, please allow me a couple of moments to tell you a little bit about Eastern State Penitentiary and what we do here. So Eastern State was built in 1829 on a cherry orchard just outside of Philadelphia. It's probably best known for its architecture, which is radial in design and resembles the spokes of a wheel. Eastern State was founded on a singular idea, and that was that rehabilitation for people in prison was only possible through solitary or separate confinement, what was then known as the Pennsylvania system. And this was tested on tens of thousands of people for over 80 years until 1913, when Eastern State formally abandoned solitary confinement in favor of a more congregate arrangement. Eastern State closed in 1971 and sat abandoned for a number of years. Today, Eastern State is a museum and historic site dedicated to interpreting the history of American criminal justice reform. And in order to do that, Eastern State built a 15 foot tall bar graph on the penitentiary's baseball field. It's pictured here. We call it the big graph. And the big graph does a couple of things. One side shows the US rate of incarceration over time. The side that we're looking at here shows the US rate of incarceration compared to every other nation on earth. And the third side of the graph shows the shameful racial disparities in our criminal justice system. That is that people of color are disproportionately overrepresented in the American prison population. The big graph has a partner exhibit. It's called Prisons Today, Questions in the Age of Mass Incarceration, where visitors are encouraged to consider their relationship to the criminal justice system. Now, if you are interested in connecting to Eastern State's mission on a deeper level, you should consider becoming a member. Members get access to all kinds of great things, including exclusive programming. If you're interested in becoming a member or learning more, you can visit easternstate.org slash membership. There's plenty of ways to stay connected to Eastern State. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, also at easternstate.org. And you won't want to miss our Searchlight program next month. We're going to be talking about correcting correctional centers. We'll be joined by the Incarceration Nations Network and AMEND, which seeks to change correctional culture, as well as Unlocked Graduates, which is a UK-based organization. That's Tuesday, October 5th at 6 p.m. live from Eastern State. If you can't come to Eastern State, you can still tune in here on Zoom and Facebook Live. And tonight we're gonna to be discussing the 50th anniversary of the Attica prison uprising. We've got an incredible panel here. Aaron Noble is the senior historian for political, governmental and military history at the New York State Museum in Albany, where he serves as the curator for the Attica prison uprising collection. Noble holds a master's degree in public history from the State University of New York, University at Albany. He is the co-author of An Irrepressible Conflict the Empire State in the Civil War, as well as A Spirit of Sacrifice, New York State in the First World War. Aaron, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Deanne Quinn Miller is the daughter of slain corrections officer William E. Quinn and member and spokesperson of the Forgotten Victims of Attica. Dee has recently completed a memoir of her life and the aftermath of the Attica riot titled The Prison Guard's Daughter, My Journey Through the Ashes of Attica, published by Diversion Books. The book is scheduled to be released today. Dee, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Dr. Heather Ann Thompson is a historian at the University of Michigan and is the Pulitzer Prize and Bancroft Prize winning author of Blood in the Water, the Attica Prison Uprising of 1971 and its legacy. She has written on the history of mass incarceration as well as its current impact for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Time, Salon, Descent, New World Forum, and the Huffington Post, as well as numerous scholarly publications. Dr. Heather Ann Thompson, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Good to be here. So just a little bit of background before we get started. So what is Attica? Well, Attica is a maximum security prison that's located in the upstate New York town of the same name, Attica. Attica Prison was built in 1931, so about a century after Eastern State, and it's still an active prison today, 
Of course, Attica is the location of the 1971 Attica prison uprising, which will be the focus of our conversation this evening. In addition, all of our panelists tonight are contributors to the New York State Journal special issue, Attica's Legacy at 50, Summer 2021. Aaron actually serves as the reviews editor for this publication. Now, I want to get into this special issue and the Open Wounds exhibition at the New York State Museum and, of course, Dee Quinn Miller's forthcoming book. But first, I was hoping we could talk about the conditions that preceded the uprising and how events unfolded. So, Aaron, if it's all right, I'd like to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what was happening at Attica Prison leading up to the uprising? Sure. Um, as you mentioned, Attica was, was constructed during the Great Depression. Um, by the summer of 1971, it was uh, exceeding its capacity. Um, it was conditions there. It was freezing cold in the winter. Um, anyone that's been in upstate New York knows that the winters are incredibly brutal. Uh, it was scalding hot in the summer. Um, the treatment of the prisoners uh, in terms of um, their kind of daily subsistence, they were uh, issued one roll of toilet paper a month. Uh, the food they were uh, provided wasn't uh, enough to sustain uh, most uh, average men um, calorically um, wages in terms of the prison uh, industries were uh, were so low that they couldn't that the men incarcerated at Attica couldn't supplement their diet and they're also trying to to purchase needed kind of necessities uh, at the commissary um, so there was a uh, and this was Attica was not unique um, in the New York State prison system or I think in, in prisons around the country um, the official state report after the Attica uprising um, basically says that Attica, the uprising could have happened anywhere it happens at Attica. Uh, during the summer of, of 1971, uh, a group of prisoners um, at the, the prison uh, submit uh, a manifesto uh, to the commissioner of prisons, um, to the to governor of New York, uh, in the attempt to redress some of their grievances um, through uh, kind of the procedural means. And um, one of the items, and if you don't mind, I'll share my screen at this point. Um, one of the items in the museum's collection uh, is uh, this 1971 manifesto uh, created by uh, Herbert Blyden and uh, a group of other men incarcerated at Attica, um, where they were writing to uh, to address some of these issues, and I think I just shared the wrong. Uh, anyway, um, so this is the, the first two pages of the, the Attica Liberation Faction Manifesto of Demands. Um, the second page really is, is, is impactful in that they, they're writing in the fact that they recognize the fact that because they're incarcerated, um, Many of their grievances and their and their uh, their treatment is really kind of out of um, the public view, and, um, and so they attempt to have their uh, their grievances addressed, and uh, nothing really happens. Um, the grievance, the manifesto is is uh, written. Um, based on a similar manifesto at Folsom Prison in California, um, kind of indicating and really highlighting the fact that, that this wasn't a unique situation to Attica, this was a, a nationwide problem. Um, and so it's at that point that you, it, that's in the summer of 1971, and by the end of the summer, you're, uh, you're seeing conditions at the prison uh, really reaching a boiling point. I think it's really important that you mentioned that this was not unique to this institution. Um, I think that that's really critical. Thank you for bringing that up. Dr. Thompson, so how did these incarcerated men take control of the facility and what was at stake for them? Well, I think it's important to realize that it's not just the, the prisoners that realize that the conditions are deteriorating, that tensions are really high. I think the corrections officers, as, as Dee can speak to, uh, are 
also realizing the, the prisons are in bad shape. Uh, the guards are overworked. They are feeling the pressures of the system. There's too many people in the system. The conditions are bad. The budgets are low. The corrections officers are overworked. The prisoners are there way too many hours in the cells. Uh, the, the budgets are too thin. And uh, the system is not doing what the American public is being told it's supposed to do, which is to make the society safer, to turn people back to communities uh, better off than when they went into the system. Uh, corrections officers are showing up to work, uh, insufficient training, uh, out, out, outnumbered, feeling nervous to come to work. Uh, people inside of the system are feeling uh, scared themselves, feeling that they are not uh, not uh, getting the training they need, not getting the food they need, not uh, understanding the parole rules. Everything is capricious. Uh, it, the whole system is is cracking at the seams and. The, the, the guards are telling the union something needs to give. The prisoners are telling, uh, begging for something to give. They're writing letters to uh, their state senators. They're, they're telling the corrections uh, officials something has to give. Nobody is doing anything. And in fact, quite the opposite. Everyone is sort of turning a blind eye. And when this actually erupts, it is a series of, uh, frankly, uh, stupid decisions on the part of prison management, uh, not informing uh, the corrections officers of decisions that are being made in the minute that are creating uh, tense situations on the ground uh, on the morning of September 9th, locking uh, essentially prisoners and guards in this hallway in a very tense situation. And without going into the very specific details, uh, circumstances erupt in such a way that uh, a gate comes down uh, in, in very traumatic and tragic circumstances that the entire facility then is uh, out of control. Uh, riot conditions erupt. And frankly, what is remarkable is that out of that chaos and trauma, uh, what will come out of it will be a pretty a uh, remarkable uh, human rights protest for uh, improving conditions in that prison. But in that moment, uh, it is a it is an extremely dangerous situation created, in fact, by, by uh, management missteps and one that undoubtedly could have been avoided had, had state officials simply heeded the cries of both guards and prisoners to treat people with basic human dignity while they were serving sentences that jurors had some measure of faith uh, would, you know, would be uh, served humanely. Thanks. So, Dee, you were five years old in September of 1971. You write in the special issue, quote, I knew my connection, but I didn't know my history. Those are two different things. I was the oldest daughter of the first person to die in the Attica riot, but who was I? Who was my dad?" End quote. Dee, can you tell us a little bit about your father and how these events shaped your childhood? Sure. Um, I'll start, I'll, I'll, I'll lead off the other side of what Heather was saying is that it was a terrible, you know, almost instantaneous kind of thing where a gate fell. And that unfortunately was where my father was that day. Uh, he was in Times Square and a gate fell, um, which left him defenseless and he was beaten very badly. Uh, my dad was only 28 years old. He was working vacation relief in the Attica prison. And uh, he had started out about a year and seven months earlier, first working at Greenhaven and being transferred to Attica. Um, but when I talk about, like, I know who I, I know who I am. I'm the daughter of William Quinn, right? But what is my history? So when you don't really kind of know your parents' history, that's who kind of you are, right? That's how you base kind of your identity. And as you grow, you get your own identity. And, and when I was a little girl, my identity to most people was that's Billy Quinn's daughter. And I would kind of know myself as Billy Quinn's daughter, but I didn't have a story that kind of went um, any farther than that at home. Um, my mother, of course, you know, was raising two girls and found out that she was pregnant with a third um, uh, shortly after my dad died. And I think that 
the information that I was given was always kind of limited, probably for two reasons. I think she was trying to, you know, obviously give us information as small children as best she could. At the same time, I think protecting her heart, because I think, you know, the loss of her husband uh, was just the brightest loss of her life. So when I say I, I know my history, but I don't necessarily, you know, know who my dad is. And so and that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. And, and as a child, you know, I, I never really felt comfortable asking people within my family about my dad. Um, so I kind of had this very short, brief kind of narrative, um, not necessarily encouraged to find out any more information. Um, and so as I grew up, I started putting pieces of my life puzzle together. And, um, you know, eventually this is kind of what led me on this journey uh, to the book. Thank you, Dee. Uh, we'll get to some of those other points in just a moment. Uh, Dr. Tom Thompson, I want to go back to you for a second. Can you tell us a little bit about how the uprising sort of came to a close and then the cover up that would guide your work later? And I'm painting in broad strokes, um, so forgive me, but can you tell us a little bit about how this crisis ended and what would unfold after that? Well, it goes to the heart of what Dee is mentioning, uh, you know, to ask questions about what had happened to Attica, whether it was your own life story or whether it was the national story was, was, was very frowned upon because this was traumatic. It was traumatic for the families of Attica. It was traumatic for the families of prisoners. It was traumatic for everybody who was touched by it. And it was traumatic for the nation because what happened was there was four days, four long days and long nights where the nation and really the world is gathered at Attica watching with bated breath as these men invite in the media and they invite in uh, observers and uh, they elect men to represent them out of their cell blocks. It's this experiment in democracy in many ways. They negotiate uh, successfully 28 demands for a more you know, humane prison conditions with the state of New York. Uh, it, it seems to be going uh, really well, notwithstanding the fact that, of course, you know, behind the scenes, of course, tr most traumatically, uh, Dee's father uh, dies of the injuries to his head. Uh, but but there is, you know, enormous hope that out of that trauma, can, can something good can come out of it. Something good can be negotiated out of it. But meanwhile, what we don't really understand is happening is that the governor of the state of New York is really planning on an armed assault of this facility, notwithstanding all this good that could, could potentially come out of it. There are lives at stake. There are uh, civilian and guard hostages inside of this prison. There are prisoner lives at stake. And with all of this writing on it, there's gonna be an armed retaking. And that armed retaking is gonna result in 128 people being shot, some of them six, seven times. It's gonna result in 39 men being killed, both uh, both prisoners and civilians, uh, hostages, uh, civilian staff alike. And it's going to result in families being forever, ever changed. But here's the deal. The state of New York steps out in front of that prison and tells those families and tells the American people that something completely different happened than what happened. They say the prisoners killed the hostages. And they say that that the only people to blame for what happened were the prisoners. Well, after you're told this, um, and you're basically told, you know, well, you know, I'm so sorry, but there's nothing we could do. The prisoners are animals. There's nothing we could do. Go home. You know, we're so sorry. Nobody wants to revisit this trauma. Everyone kind of goes to their corners. Everyone's bamboozled. Everyone feels like, my God, what went so wrong? And so no one wants to, to touch this. It's, it's so raw. It's so traumatic. Well, it turns out it was all a lie. And for 40 years, people don't want to revisit this. And meanwhile, what in fact is going on, the prisoners are being tortured mercilessly. The, 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 the hostage families are suffering traumatically, mercilessly, being swindled by the state of New York out of their, their rightful uh, ability to sue the state of New York. And it's going to take decades to know 
the extent of what in fact was a cover up. It's gonna take decades to know that in fact, the state of New York not only willfully did this, but protected the members of law enforcement that carried out this trauma. And so for someone like Dee, but also uh, the other widows, the other daughters, the other sisters, brothers, sons, mothers of hostages, uh, families and prisoner families alike, um, you know, there's a reason we don't know much about Attica. There's a reason why it took you know, decades for her to write this book, for me to write this book. You know, we should understand those records still are not available for us to just go in there and see what happened. Uh, even though these are state institutions, these are, these are we pay for these institutions. And um, so that's something for us to all, you know, it's something for us to all really think about. Uh, it was, it, it is something for us all to still kind of get our heads around. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Dee, you point out in your piece, which is titled Unlocking My Father's Story, that the narrative you were told growing up about Attica was challenged later in your life um, by people that you met, formerly incarcerated people who were there and knew your father. Uh, can you expound on that? Yeah. Yeah, and I'll expound on, on Heather, what she was saying too, because it's absolutely right. I mean, literally our families were fed a narrative, right? And if we were going to be good soldiers, we would continue to carry that narrative on. And, you know, my mother was just like everybody else's moms. You know, they weren't working at the time and they wanted to do what was right. And so I had a very small narrative, like I spoke about earlier, you know, like, and the narrative went kind of like, inmates bad, corrections officers good. And, and there's really kind of a black and white kind of a thing going on there. And so as I grew up, you know, not really knowing a lot about my dad and, and of course not getting a lot of information from my family, I was forced to have to look um, to other people for information about my dad. And I started with, you know, people like, um, you know, people he graduated with, you know, I found out my father played on a baseball team. I never even knew. It. I mean, these, these simple things. I never knew about my dad because of the way that my family chose to handle um, the aftermath of Attica in their lives um, had a direct impact on me and kind of left me with all these pieces to put together. And I, I was raised in a small town, um, racist type of family. I had a stepfather that my mother or my mother remarried some years later and he was in law enforcement. So um, Stepping outside the box in which I lived in to find information about my dad was really not supported. And when most of these people that I went to find information from were, you know, former black inmates, um, you know, the reception within my family wasn't all that good. But the information that I got just helped me put those pieces together because I've known all my life that this narrative that was pushed out by the state that was held by the families because they're they're the you know they're the state employees they got to do the right thing right um, this narrative for me was a challenge for most of my life I knew it wasn't right I just didn't know what parts of it weren't right so um, speaking with people like Frank Smith who's otherwise known as Big Black uh, Richard Clark Gene Hitchens I mean I've talked to Brother Sharif I've talked to lots of people that put pieces together for me that I did not even think about. Um, and so that's how I, again, you know, the journey later in life, this is how I started formulating the story of who my dad was, what kind of correction officer was, what happened to him during the riot, you know, how did they get him from point A to point B? Um, and all this information I was able to put together with the help of correction officers that were working with my dad, but also of inmates um, that had really great information that I desperately needed. Wow, that's fascinating. Thank you, Dee. Uh, I wanna shift our focus towards the Open Wounds exhibition. Erin, can you tell us about creating the exhibit and what you hope people will take away from experiencing it? Uh, I'm also gonna share my screen right now, if that's all right, and put up some of the panels. Yeah, um, well, when we had begun this kind of planning process a few years ago, um, we had started uh, reaching out to Dee and um, 
other stakeholders. Um, and our hope was to have a full scale in gallery experience for the exit for the anniversary. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the COVID pandemic um, really curtailed uh, some of those efforts. Um, so in the intervening time, we're still hopeful um, and pushing to and working towards um, that eventual larger exhibit. But in in order to make sure that we had something that commemorated the anniversary, um, we uh, developed a, a panel exhibit uh, called Open Wounds uh, that is available. It will be uh, opening at the New York State Museum here in Albany on September 9th. Um, it's, uh, but it's a panel exhibit that was designed by New York State Museum uh, exhibit designers, um, but is available for uh, museums, libraries, historical societies uh, across the state or really across the country uh, who are interested in um, exhibiting uh, information about Attica. Um, we've partnered here in New York with Humanities New York uh, so that smaller organizations can actually um, receive these files and have them printed at no cost to themselves, um, which is a tremendous benefit in order to be able to, to make sure that this kind of reaches as broad an audience and, and really starts conversations about um, something that uh, a pivotal and critical event in New York State history, but one that is um, really not talked about. Absolutely. And follow up question for you, Aaron, what are the challenges of interpreting the history of an event that implicates the state? Uh, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a unique project for us. Um, fact that um, the state is really the perpetrator of, of the vast majority of the violence. Um, the fact that the state then embarked on several decades long um, effort to kind of to conceal and to cover up um, its actions at Attica, the fact that the families of the hostages were treated um, in such a hor uh, horrendous way um, makes it challenging when you're you're the New York State Museum. Um, not only um, because there is, I think at times a, a feeling that the museum is the spokesperson for the state of New York. Um, that uh, and we were very conscious of, of that kind of that that perception um, amongst the stakeholders and, and we were really working to to meet with and, and create a rapport and a relationship with stakeholders from around who participated or experienced Attica um, in order to make sure that we could accurately portray the history. Um, and hopefully for those who visit and, and view the, the panels, it's, it's um, we've tried to pre present um, the story uh, and, the, and the way that the uh, the events at Attica impacted um, a variety of, of the participants. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Dr. Thompson, your piece in the special issue is titled Reckoning with the Artifacts of Attica, What Was Found, What Wasn't, and Why It Matters. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about these artifacts, how you encountered them, and why what's missing from the collection is so significant. Yeah, I have to say um, on that, uh, I really, I really have to shout out Aaron's work on this uh, this exhibit. Um, I I would be dishonest if I would not just say right up front, I was very, very dubious <laughs> of what was going to come. And Aaron knows this. I was very dubious of what was going to come of this exhibit, not in Aaron's hands per se, but in the state archives hands. And that's because, frankly, um, the, the artifacts that were handed over from the state police that were really the genesis of the original plan to do the exhibit now going back to 2011, were deeply, deeply problematic. These were artifacts that were handed over by the state police that had been in a Quonset hut that were uh, originally scooped up in D-Yard on the uh, day of the actual retaking of Attica. 
these were uh, pieces of, and I put this very deliberately in quotation marks, evidence that the very same troopers that had uh, stormed Attica had collected to uh, essentially make the case that the prisoners were all about what had gone wrong at Attica and uh, were essentially going to use these pieces of evidence to trot out in criminal cases for the next essentially, you know, <laughs> decade uh, to indict 62 prisoners. And meanwhile, not a single uh, member of law enforcement was held responsible for the fact that 39 people were uh, gunned down and killed in that yard. And so I was very dubious if these were the artifacts upon which this exhibit was going to be erected. There were no, uh, there were no bullets, <laughs> there were no guns, there, were, there was absolutely nothing that had been collected that could explain the amount of bloodshed, that could explain the amount of trauma that uh, befell the families that we've just been talking about uh, since we've all convened tonight. And what was there were, for example, all the baseball bats that the, <laughs> that the men in the yard used to have baseball games whenever they were not locked in their cells, which was not very often. Uh, they, they, you know, they collected uh, rags because potentially those could have been lit to be Molotov cocktails. They, they, they collected things that could be potentially and ostensibly uh, used to indicate prisoner violence. And, you know, they also collected a whole lot of things that were very, very traumatic, you know, they all the ripped and shredded photographs of people's children and, you know, their all of their legal documents torn up and their cells had been tossed. So the question was, what was the state of New York, meaning the archives in this case, going to do with all of this? And, um, and I have to say, uh, there were some tense moments in the early days, because I'm not sure anyone really knew what they were going to do with this, because there's a lot of pressure, frankly, I think, on the archivists, plural, uh, in that institution about what to do, pressure coming from the state police themselves, pressure coming from a lot of people who had a lot to say about what should this exhibit should look like. So great, great kudos to what, in fact, I think has come about of it which has been to really listen to um, the people whose story this was, including uh, the incarcerated whose story this at bottom was and the victims uh, and the families of the corrections officers whose story this was. So I'm, I'm really, really glad to see what came of it. Um, but it was, uh, it was not at all clear to me that that's what was gonna be the case. Thank you for that. And I wanna ask you a follow-up question. You said that before the Attica uprising, polling data showed that Americans were empathetic of people in prison and wanted to move away from harsh punishments like excessive incarceration and the death penalty. So how did Attica and the narrative that's presented by the state through these artifacts shift public opinion about people in prison so dramatically? Well, you know, there's, it's interesting. I, I, I'm about ready this week to come out with an article on time, in Time Magazine where I'm gonna talk about this much more directly and explicitly, but I think it's something that we really, really need to think about hard when it comes to what happened at Attica. I think the state of New York, we talk a lot about the impact on New York, but I don't think we've fully reckoned with what the impact of this has been on the nation as a whole. Let's don't forget that the nation was watching what was happening at Attica. And on the eve of Attica, remember that the death penalty was on, you know, we were, we were moving away from the death penalty. We were moving away from warehousing people. We were thinking in terms of community corrections. We were thinking about redoing criminal justice. We were thinking about things like uh, Estelle versus Gamble. We were thinking about laws. Uh, we were thinking about pieces of legislation to humanize what was going on behind bars. We were in the middle of a civil rights era. Uh, if you look at polling data, people were in favor of things like Miranda rights, uh, you know, uh, training for corrections officers, things like that. When you look at the incarceration rate, it isn't, it isn't really the war on crime per se that you start seeing prison numbers go up. It's actually 19 
1972, 1973, the numbers just go through the roof. And really specifically, it's the Rockefeller drug laws. It is Rock, you know, Rockefeller out Nixon's Nixon. Rockefeller is the one who really is the driver in ways we do not talk about. And it's, it's the Attica Rockefeller, and it is the messages sent from the steps of Attica that prisoners, you thought they were all about human rights, you thought they were all about just, uh, we just want to be treated as human, but no, they're animals, they're barbaric, they do these horrific things. You were all sold a false bill of goods. And they lied. And, and, and America believed the lies, and we have all paid a horrific price for those lies. Not just the families on the ground, which has been terrible, but all of us, whether we live in Kansas, whether we live in New York, whether we live in Hawaii, whether we live in Puerto Rico, we've all paid for those lies because we were all watching. And, and now we look that this stuff is being exported globally. Uh, and so I think we we really underestimate how significant this was because because guess what it wasn't just lies told at Attica, you know it was a it was a lies told in general about the violence of this period. We were told that you know the anti-war protesters were violent, uh, prisoners were violent, uh, you know everybody was violent except for who was really violent. Uh, it was an out of control law enforcement in this time period just to quell basic participatory democracy. And, and we got to really think about that. Thank you for putting that in a national and international perspective. I look forward to reading that article on time you were just talking about. So Dee, you write that the most healing experience and the place where you received the most information regarding your father was from other group members of the forgotten victims of Attica. Can you tell us why this organization was formed and what its goals are? Sure. Uh, before I do that, I do also want to thank Aaron uh, for what they've done up there. He knows that I have been uh, in the past highly suspicious of what activity is taking place up there and what is going on. And uh, I have to say that, um, you know, I, I'm a difficult one when it comes to trusting, but I, I do trust Aaron and Jennifer very much for what they're you know, doing up there. Um, I think it is a difficult uh, walk that they're taking uh, because we are pointing a finger at the very place that it should be pointed, which is at the state of New York. And I can only imagine um, how sticky that might get for you. But in the meantime, you guys are doing it. And I, I personally very much appreciate it. So let me get back to the Forgotten Victims of Attica. So we are a group uh, that actually got together um, uh, in response to the inmate um, settlement. So it was right around 2000 when I had gotten a call from uh, um, uh, an individual who said, hey, you know, we're not really liking what we're hearing. I don't know if there's anything we can do about it, but do you want to get together? And so we started getting together. Um, and it was a very interesting because um, although I left Attica when I was little, I only lived eight miles away. Um, and with 50 families being uh, the 50 families that had that were killed and or injured during um, the retaking, uh, I hardly knew anybody. So we are all kind of kind of coming together for the first time. And it's kind of that old story as, as you know, we were being good soldiers for the state of New York, right? I mean, our families were encouraged to kind of not talk about Attica, even though we all kind of lived in the same town. We were encouraged to, you know, you know not talk about what happened. Um, I mean, I have two friends that are correction officers that retired that were both held hostage that used to um, do outside duty, which would be running inmates to um, funerals, et cetera. For 20 years, they never spoke to each other about being held hostage in the same yard, just several people apart all the time that they worked together. I mean, talk about being good soldiers, right? So this is what they do. So we, we all came together and we started learning things. And I started learning things about my dad because these are people who worked with my dad. Um, some went and trained, were in training with my father and so on. So that's where I picked up some more information about my dad. Um, but it was um, the Forgotten Victims of Attica is a very big part of my life. And it's, it's like a whole nother family now um, of people who share a very similar experience. Because when you talk to people about 
you know, my dad was killed in the Annika riot, you know, he's the only one killed by inmates or, you know, grew up like this. I mean, people are kind of like, whoa. But when you talk to those families, they're like, yeah, we did that. You know, this was our experience too, or I kind of grew up like this too. Uh, and it was so nice for the first time in my life having that kind of commonality. Right. Thank you so much for that, Dee. Um, mm -hmm. So in the special issue, there is an illustration that is included in Dee's uh, in Dee's article, and I asked Dee permission to share it tonight, and I'm going to put it up on the screen now. And Dee, I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about this image with us. Sure. So this is um, a beautiful picture that my daughter did in charcoal, um, and it is uh, it, it, this this drawing depicts the three keys that were on my father's belt. There were the three keys that were left. Um, they were given to my mother um, in the hospital uh, when she went to go uh, and, and visit him when he was initially uh, taken to the Batavia Hospital after his injuries um, on the morning of the 9th. And it's an odd kind of thing, but um, they mean the world to me because they're kind of like the only tangible objects that I have, which is weird because there's just three keys. And if you can look on them, they say one of them says 72 of them, I think say 71 on them, which is very interesting. But um, and you know, it's like there's three Quinn girls, there's three keys, each of us have a key, it's kind of strange. But anyhow, um, my daughter knew how much those those keys meant to me. So she did that drawing for her for me. And essentially, um, she says that the gray cement background represents the outside walls of the Attica prison. The dragonfly symbolizes transformation and adaptability. And it appears in the lives, the dragonflies appear in the lives of people to remind them to embrace lightness and joy. That's incredible. I really like that last part. Um, please pass your thanks along to your daughter for um, letting us share this this evening. Thank you. And I have one more question for you, Dee, before I want to move on. So our program coincides with the release of your new book, which is titled The Prison Guard's Daughter, My Journey Through the Ashes of Attica. I'm wondering if you would mind telling us a little bit about what it was like to write this book and what might surprise readers about it. Um, okay. <laughs> it was pretty hard writing the book. Um, I, we had a very short deadline, um, about five and a half weeks that they extended to about seven and a half weeks. And after helping Heather with her book, I mean, I can't, I mean, it looked this, you know, this woman worked on this book for years and years and years, and I work on mine for like seven and a half months, um, or seven and a half weeks, I should say. Um, so I kind of highlighted as much as I could, you know, about my life and, you know, the, you know, the trauma of being a young girl who, um, you know, has their father die in a very public way that, you know, is not just a statewide thing, but it's a nationwide thing. Um, so I, I did the best I could on it um, in the short time that we had. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with it. I hope that people enjoy it. I think it's a little different perspective because we have historians that have written, right? But this is the story about, I think, I think it's a story that maybe every law enforcement person can kind of think about because those that put on badges uh, every day or put on corrections uniforms and they go into that prison and they make the assumption that they're coming home that night may not be the truth, right? And uh, who you leave behind was a little girl like myself. And so I did the best I could. Um, I really just hope to make my family proud of, of the book. And um, I don't even know what would be the most surprising part about it is that maybe some people who knew me back then would never think that because of my background, the way that I grew up, that I would ever reach out, you know, to the other side, as the state likes to put it, the inmates, that is not another side. They are a group of people who suffer just as bad as we did um, and uh, became quite close with many of them and uh, love and miss them because so many of them are gone. Maybe that might be the biggest surprise. I don't know. Thank you, Dee. Thank I you, look Dee. forward to reading. I look forward to reading the book myself. Uh, I want to ask Aaron one more question and then I want to dip into the Q&A because I think that there's a really uh, great question in there. So Aaron, one of the learning objectives of Open Wounds is to realize the ways in which 
the need for criminal justice reform contributed to the events at Attica. You mentioned that at the top of our program and how they still resonate today. So these learning objectives were created before COVID-19. And as we know, COVID-19 has an outsized impact on people in prison. So I'm wondering, how do you think that the events of, I suppose the last year and a half, two years, specifically the crisis of COVID in prison will impact visitor reactions to the exhibit? Um, well, I mean, for starters, the, the, the fact that medical care and access to medical care continues now 50 years later to be a serious concern for uh, incarcerated men and women uh, in New York State prisons and prisons across the country, um, I think was only highlighted and exacerbated by the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then uh, now speaking as um, as a resident of New York and not necessarily as the, the curator or the historian for the State Museum, um, I think that the um, the fact that events going on in prisons in, in New York and, and elsewhere remain kind of literally behind concrete walls, um, so much of it remains unknown. Um, we still don't, as the public, fully grasp and understand the, the impact of COVID um, in the prisons. We know it was and it has been um, uh, terrible. Um, but we don't, I don't know as we know the full extent. And I think that that, that level of the lack of transparency um, is very reminiscent and, and kind of continues kind of that story of Attica. Yeah, absolutely. And then in a, you know, in a similar vein, I, I had crafted a similar question for Dr. Thompson, but somebody wrote in the Q&A uh, better than I could. So I'm gonna direct this uh, question to Dr. Thompson, but I want everyone to feel free to uh, answer. The question is, do we have a similar situation to Attica in this person specifically said Philadelphia prisons today, but I suppose we could think even larger uh, with severe understaffing, rampant violence, and of course the issue of COVID, certain people being unvaccinated or not having access to the vaccines. So I guess I want to direct this to uh, Dr. Thompson first. Do we have a similar situation or set of circumstances happening in the United States? today? Of course we do. Of course we do. I mean, it is, it is, it is unfathomable that we are, we have our head in the sand to the extent that we, we, we do right now. Um, we have, uh, we have more than a million people more in prison now than we did in 1971. The conditions are abysmal right now. Uh, this is even before COVID, but let's just throw COVID in on top of that. Let, let's talk about the fact that people cannot socially distance. Uh, the, the medical care was already so, so terrible in, inside. Uh, between privatized medical care, even in state prison systems uh, across the country, uh, the, the, the terrible state of medical care, um, the COVID situation for correctional staff and the incarcerated alike inside is abysmal. Um, the, 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 the level of overcrowding, violence, exploitation, uh, I mean, we, we, could, we don't have enough time in this program to go into how terrible things are. And the, the, the correctional staff are enduring it the, the, uh, uh, and, and feeling those pressures. The uh, incarcerated are feeling those pressures day in and day out. And uh, we have a system that has no other way to deal with social harm on the outside. We have decided that the solution to every problem is a criminal justice solution. Uh, if we have a problem, our solution is lock them up, arrest them. And we know that that is not going to work because if it did work in our own families, that's what we would do. If we have a child with a drug addiction, we'd say, great idea, let's call the cops. Great idea, let's lock our children up. That's not what we do. When we have a problem in our own families, if we have any resources whatsoever, the last thing we want to do is call the police. The last thing we want to do is throw our children in prison because we know it doesn't work, because we know it makes things worse. 
So if we know that, we know this doesn't work, and we know that these, these institutions are cruising for trouble, and we see it. The St. Louis jail has just erupted not once but twice this, this year. We know that Indiana's prisons erupted. We know that the Manhattan jail has erupted. Of course, Philadelphia's prisons are in trouble. People are suffering inside. And, um, and so if we don't do something, uh, Attica is the tip of the iceberg. Yuma, Arizona, just not too long ago. It was in Attica, but you don't know about it because that also was covered up. Uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a horrible situation out there. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's not good. And, and we have a responsibility now at 50 years after Attica to do something differently. Other countries know how to do it differently. We are smart enough. We can figure this out. But this solution you don't lock up problems. That, that's not how you deal with it. If it was, we'd all be doing it. And that's not what we do if we have any other choice. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Uh, Dee, I wanna open that up to you as well. Is there anything you'd like to add? I do think that our prisons you know, are dangerous. I can say that I do believe that since Attica, there has been some changes within the New York State prison system. Um, you know, I don't think that we would ever have state police come in um, and you know, help take over a prison. Now we have cert teams that um, are in each jail that would, you know, um, essentially be deployed into the jails and help out. There is some things, but I do agree with Heather on, on many of those facts. I mean, um, just I don't even know two weeks ago, I think it was in um, one of our Auburn jails. I mean, we had a t we had a terrible situation with gang members. Um, you know, and uh, correction officers being hurt very badly. Um, and I think that a lot of the same situations um, that Attica had in 71, you can easily see in many of our jails um, now. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, I'm gonna direct this question to you. Uh, somebody in the Q&A asked if you've ever felt pressure to clean up the story from the state, whether that's overt or subtle. Yeah, I would have I me. Mean, I guess it would be subtle. Um, there was the tendency for, for for the state museum is to work closely with other agencies um, when collecting, and um, when those agencies were the New York State Police. Um, in this case, it it becomes problematic, and uh, so there was a tendency when we were initially talking about the planning that oh, we should include. Um, the New York State Police, and we should include docs um, without necessarily the follow-up of and forgotten victims and uh, the formerly incarcerated men uh, and survivors. Um, but to the credit of, of management here at the museum, they were open to um, our arguments that that the state's narrative has been kind of the primary narrative for four decades that we need to. Uh, bring out the bring out these other voices that have kind of been sh shunted to the side and and make sure that those were the prominent parts of the narrative um so so yeah i mean to our credit and, and our management has been very supportive of of this project and and so we're thankful for for that kind of cover um and, and the assistance that they've offered great thank you uh, and this may be our last question of the evening. I'm gonna direct it first to Dr. Thompson, but of course I'd like everybody to chime in if you can. Uh, rewinding a little bit, the question is, how did the Attica lie get exposed? Was there a single cataclysmic event or a series of smaller events? Dr. Thompson, would you mind weighing in? Well, of course, there's a series of events. Um, the thing about lies is they never stay hidden forever because the uh, the survivors are, have always been telling the truth, <laughs> right, Dee? I mean, anyone who has experienced this, they've always been telling the truth. The incarcerated people were always telling what had happened to them. The uh, correction officers, survivors were always telling what had happened to them. Uh, Malcolm Bell was a whistleblower prosecutor who had always been telling what had happened. And when I came along, I happened to find documents. I was greatly lucky that I happened to find what I I found. But the thing about lies is 
you can't keep him hidden forever. And there will be still more to divulge, you can be sure, uh, because you can't cover up the truth. And so they just might as well get on with it and just open the records because it's going to come out. So let's get on with the healing. Thank you for that. D, anything to add? I think that's, I think Heather's absolutely right. I mean, you know, you can, these cover ups, I think, you know, were a series of them. I think one of the very first ones, of course, you know, that got him in terrible trouble was um, when Dr. Edlin, who was the first individual who autopsied those bodies, you know, and he's looking through them and the state police are standing right there. And um, nearly every bullet was a state police bullet. Uh, however, one was not, it was a corrections officer bullet. Um, and, you know, so when he comes out and says it publicly, oh, the, you know, these individuals that I just autopsied, which are, you know, the dead people from the yard, um, they were killed by, you know, state police gunfire and one corrections officer, you know, bullet. Um, I think, uh, you know, that didn't go so well for him. Um, and the state started backpedaling fast and they tried covering it up and they, you know, all the things that the state of New York has done in the treatment of our families that are state employees, the abys you know, just abysmal treatment, just, you know, I mean, I could tell, like, I feel like Heather, I feel like I could like, I mean, you get me started on the attic, I could just probably talk all night long and people are like horrified because, you know, people think they know the story about Attica, but when you're a family member and you've lived through this, uh, you know, this kind of treatment and what they've done, uh, it's, it's just terrible. But I believe like Heather, there is plenty more secrets to be uh, heard. Um, I know there is some legislation right now uh, for the opening of the records, including grand jury. So that may uh, take root and uh, maybe we'll be seeing something. And then my last thing that I've always asked for that I've asked seven governors for that is ever so important to me is an apology. You know, we have a five point plan for justice to forgot victims of Attica. You know, we get our reparations, we get a memorial service, we get counseling, you know, we get the ability to hold our service. We don't get an apology, which you would think I thought would be the easiest thing to do. Can't get it. I'd like an apology. I'm waiting. Thank you, Dee. Aaron, anything to add there? I don't think I can. No. <laughs> okay. uh, before we conclude tonight, Dee, tell us where folks can find your book. Well, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Barnes and Noble. You can go to your you know, hometown bookstore. If they don't already have it, you can ask them to order it. You can go out to our website. It's the prisonguardsdaughter.com. And there's uh, you know, sites there that will tell you where you can get the book as well. Excellent, thanks. And Erin, how can folks connect with the Open Wounds exhibit, the New York History Journal issue, and anything else that's going on at the New York State Museum? Um, sure, um, I will uh, put the uh, exhibit link in the uh, chat box. Um, so the New York State Museum exhibit here in Albany will open on uh, September 9th. Um, it will be open um, at least through the end of this year. Uh, Rochester Public Library opened on September 1st uh, and will run through January 28th of 2022. Um, Dr. Thompson's uh, article uh, and contribution for the special edition is available from Cornell University Press and I will also put that in the chat box. Um, her article is available outside of the paywall. Um, subscribers can go visit Cornell University Press um, from their website and subscribe to the email or uh, find New York History Journal on Project News uh, through their local public libraries. Excellent. Thanks, Aaron. And Dr. Thompson, how can folks stay up to date with what you're working on? Uh, well, you can find the history, the the voluminous history of, of the whole uprising and the fight for justice, including the forgotten victims fight for justice uh, and the prisoners fight for justice in Blood in the Water, which is also on Amazon, like Dee's book, but buy Dee's book first because it's coming out today. And, uh, and then uh, I will have the article coming out on 50 years after Attica in time. Uh, I think uh, it's subscribers have already gotten it, I heard, but uh, it should be on maybe online tomorrow. And, uh, and now I'm working on a different, uh, another uh, kind of traumatic event that happened in Philadelphia, which is uh, on the move bombing in 1985. And that is another one of those uh, sagas that just goes on and on. And it'll take me a long time to do that one too, but uh, more, uh, more detours and, and travails, but, but don't, don't hold your breath on that one because that's going to take a while. <laughs> okay. 
Well, Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for being a part of our program. D. Quinn Miller, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Aaron Noble, thank you so much for being a part of our program. It means a lot. I also want to say thank you to Eastern States President and CEO, Sally Elk, our Vice President, Sean Kelly, and our Director of Marketing, Nicole Frankhauser. And of course, to everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you so much. Good night. Good night.